We have another guest, you know that, by the way. This is a guest yeah, that we tried to have on last week. So when this man tweets, the motorsport world jumps into action. When this man speaks, the motorsport world listens. Nobody knows the money in motorsports more. It's Adam Stern from the Sports Business Show here on the Money Lap Live for real this time. Welcome to the show, Adam. We're really excited. that The last time I tried that, you you were there, you froze, and we were gone, and we didn't get to see you for another week. So thank you for coming on. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, so the big news that happened last week when we were trying to get you on was the NASCAR's TV deal. And we've obviously had a week to let it sort of sink in. And you've sort of had some more quotes out there and some information. So we know it's a $7.7 billion deal, $1.1 billion a year, 40% increase. But what in the, la- the last seven days – have you learned that started to stick out to you to say, you know, this is this is pretty interesting about this deal? Yeah, I mean, I think just the level of promotion that that NASCAR is going to get now from these different companies, uh, you know, that they haven't had in the past. They've kind of had it split, of course, between two companies, neither of which, of course, is ESPN. That's one thing that, uh, you know, is maybe one drawback of the deal. You're still not going to have that promotion from ESPN. But when you look at all these new companies that are going to be promoting the sport, you're going to have the CW, uh, Nexstar. They own tons of TV stations throughout the country that will have, you know, free-to-air channel NASCAR that will still be on TV. And then, of course, you're going to add in Amazon, where you're going to have streaming for the first time exclusively with NASCAR. They've never had that in the past. And then you're going to have Warner Brothers Discovery, where they're going to have not just, um, you know, it on TV and also streaming, simulcast but they'll be promoting the sport through some of their digital channels like Bleacher Report and House of Highlights, which have become some of the most kind of potent, powerful digital media platforms uh, really in all of sports in the world. So just kind of the way that NASCAR is going to be sliced and diced, um, it's kind of what they had to do to get the increase that they were looking for to try and get more money that they can pass along to their industry. But at the same time, it's led to a very interesting deal. It's going to be a little bit more complicated or, or maybe even a lot more complicated for the fans to try and kind of navigate um, not just the races, but you're going to have the first half of the season for practice and qualifying on Amazon Prime Video, except for three races, which will be on Fox. Then it'll switch over to Warner Brothers Discovery Channels, Max Streaming, and True TV. So just the way they're slicing and dicing it, I think, is really interesting. It's kind of what they had to do to get an increase. Um, but in the end, it'll lead to more promotion of the sport, most likely. So I think that's what stands out to me right now after this first week of kind of analyzing the deal. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and you make a good point about just all the different partners. So the fans are, um, you know, there's some maybe a potential risk there and just being able to find where um, the sport is going to be broadcast at the right time, um, which can have its positives and negatives, because like you said, um, now you have a lot of really big entities that are invested in the sport that are going to be promoting it. Um, and, and I feel like in our experience or in my experience in the sport, you know, working with um, networks like NBC and Fox and ESPN at times, like these traditional networks, we kind of know or we, we have experience with how they promote our sport outside of just the broadcast itself. But with a unique new partnership like Amazon, what what do you think that the industry should expect for promotion from Amazon? What is that going to look like, and how are they going to elevate us outside of just you know broadcasting it? Yeah, well, they have over a hundred million subscribers to Prime Video, firstly, and so when you look at like cable, cable used to have over a hundred million subscribers. Now they're down into the sixty seventy range. So just from like a pure number of subscribers perspective. It kind of makes sense, but you look at what they've done with the NFL. They just had that first ever Black Friday exclusive game, and they were, um, you know, promoting merchandise and and different some of their different items in, in kind of unique ways. Um, so mm-hmm. you kind of look at the way where even NASCAR now will be able to kind of try and sell merchandise to fans for those races. There could some be some unique things that pop up on screen, um, but you know they have just a huge, of course, uh, consumer base. So. Um, you know, Prime, and which, of course, is part of the overall delivery platform they have, and then they have Prime Video that's part of it, again, uh, well over 100 million subscribers. So I think just, the you know, as long as they promote the sport in different ways to uh, the people who are watching that platform, you know, those are a lot of different people who are, you know, 
cord cutters, cord nevers, people who don't have cable. So this is going to help reach people who are not currently watching Fox or NBC. And so it'll reach kind of some new folks. Um, and then again, you know, you have the, the money element of it. Um, you know, certainly this was something that uh, NASCAR did to help make sure that they could get as much money for the industry that, that, that they could. Um, basically a 40% increase. Some people might have wanted a little bit more. You know, you hear some folks from some teams who said, oh, I would have loved that to have been, you know, a 100% increase. But the reality is, is that NASCAR's ratings have dropped, you know, 50, 60% since the last time they negotiated this deal in 2013. So um, to get these sort of companies that still want to invest in the sport, invest huge money, you know, look at F1. I mean, they're doing pretty well, but they're only making 75 to $90 million a year in the U.S. media rights. So um, for NASCAR to be able to get $1.1 billion and then have these companies now promoting them in different ways, uh, it seems like it's a pretty good deal. I want to uh, I want to compare to F1. So we, we did some numbers here, and I, so I want to put context to what NASCAR has achieved with this. As you said, it's probably a pretty good deal. You mentioned Amazon, the house of highlights. That's them potentially getting this – in front of a younger audience than NASCAR has been in the past, right? And that's the intention there. Uh, kind of like Money Lab here on YouTube. You know, we get a very young audience. They want our audience. Over 80% under the age of 34, by the way, for advertisers out there. But um, I want to – I did. we did some numbers, and I'm not going to say any of these are, are well done. You can call BS on them if you, if you think, nope, that's not true. Uh, so we tried to sort of splice out the Xfinity deal from the $1.1 billion, which – which brings you down to 983 million. We tried to take out what we thought trucks would be, so say 23 million, a million a race. I don't know if that's true or not, but give or take. Which brings you down to like 90, 960 million for 38 cup races, which would be 25, roughly 25 million per race in media rights fees. To compare this to what I we could find uh, in F1 Global Media Rights, they're 800, basically 800 million per year in global rights in 2022, but you know, just on the media side, um, at 23 races, that's 34, almost 35 million per race. So does that seem like, you know, Na NASCAR has, you mentioned being a good deal. This is, that's a pretty large number for them to get in a time when, you know, obviously you mentioned the ratings going down, that sort of thing. Meanwhile, F1 is having this explosion in the U S they seem to have a popularity boom around the world and it's roughly 10 million more media rights per race. That seems like a win yeah, in a lot of ways. There, there are people that are surprised kind of at the extent to which NASCAR is able to get, but a couple things to keep in mind. Um, of course, they have more than two times the number of races as F1, and their races are longer, you know, significantly yep. longer than F1. Now, that brings some challenges when you look at trying to retain viewers, but it gives the network such a long time to sell ads. So. Those are some of the things that kind of play into it. And, of course, their ratings are higher than F1. Um, you know, this past season, NASCAR's ratings, I believe, were around 2.8 million-ish per cup race. Uh, F1 was a lot closer to 1 million. Uh, they were above 1 million, but much closer to it. So still close to three times as much viewers. Um, of course, the one thing that F1 really has going for it is their viewers are a lot younger. So they'll have, you know, 1.2, 1.3 million viewers in an event. But half of them, 600, 700,000, will be 18 to 49. NASCAR will have 3 million a race, but they'll still only have 600, 700,000. They're 18 to 49. So a significant percentage, uh, a much greater percentage of NASCAR's viewership is older. So, look, I mean, it is impressive what NASCAR is able to get done. I mean, their leadership team is able to extract a lot from these negotiations, uh, get a lot for the, the value of the media rights. But, um, again, there, there's a lot of reasons behind it. They, they have longer races. They have more races. They have higher ratings. They have these um, practice and qualifying sessions and uh, Xfinity and truck races that draw that draw just as well as some MLB and NHL and MLS games and, and things like that. So th there's reasons behind it, but they certainly do a good job of getting their media rights a, a lot of value. And there are people that are, are surprised, impressed, et cetera, that NASCAR's media rights in the U.S. are so much higher than, than F1s. Um, and this does bring us to the idea that you mentioned the team saying we may, some maybe wanted more of an increase, right? One of the big factors behind the scenes with this is the charter deal for the teams and what they've been trying to do going forward past 2024. 
uh, you know, many of the teams wanting to get a larger piece of this media rights pie, a larger amount of revenue from the sport. You even had the president, Steve Phelps of NASCAR, say that their teams were not profitable uh, in recent years and admit that. So one thing that wasn't announced with this was a new charter deal. What's the latest there? What are you hearing? Uh, were the teams happy about this amount of an increase? And do they expect to see some of the fruits of their labors in terms of getting a larger increase in terms of revenue from the sport? Well, one of the major battles that NASCAR won in kind of the war of these major deals that are going to set the for the future is the teams tried to negotiate a deal on the next charter agreement a little bit early. And NASCAR basically said, uh, we're not so sure about that. Go ahead, try and pull your public stunts. We'll talk to you a little bit, but we're probably not going to negotiate this charter agreement with you guys until we get a TV deal because we got to know how much we're going to get. The teams were like, ah, uh, you know, you know how much roughly you're going to get. You should just negotiate with us now. You know, NASCAR, had, the teams didn't have the leverage to really get that done. And so the reality is, to answer your first question, is that now is when they're going to really get into the nuts and bolts of negotiating the charter agreement now that they've got the TV deal, TV deal done. The week before Phoenix, um, the NASCAR president, Steve Phelps, and some of their other executives met with the teams for their regular team owner council meeting. And they discussed some of the broad outlines of what they think the deal should look like. Um, for example, there's an expectation that maybe that NASCAR is going to try and kind of build a, a stronger middle class with the new money that teams are going to get, more so than give the top teams a ton of new money. Um, I think all the charters will get uh, more money, but you might see a greater percentage increase in kind of the, the middle charters. So they kind of gave some broad outlines as to, you know, what teams can expect, but they're really going to get down to the nuts and bolts of it now because, again, NASCAR kind of won that battle. The teams were not able to force NASCAR to negotiate the charter agreement before. Um, as far as the second question about our teams happy with the amount that NASCAR got, I think some of them wanted more. Some of them thought, hey, it'd be great to get at least a 50% increase and maybe even higher. You know, ultimately, it really looks like NASCAR's coming in closer to 35%-ish, but we'll, we'll round up to 40. Uh, and also, there's questions about, you know, how much more NASCAR's going to have to pay for production now. They just opened their new production facility today. I was over there at the ribbon cutting. Um, that's going to benefit the score in a lot of ways, according to NASCAR, but also they're going to be having to pay more for production. So that raises questions about how much that erodes some of that 35 to 40% increase if their costs are going up. So I think teams ultimately realize that NASCAR did a pretty good job, but uh, you know, race teams, they always want more. Um, and yeah, you know, they do expect that they're going to get more under this deal. And, and NASCAR certainly signaled that they're going to give teams more. Where the rubber will meet the road is is how much the percentage amount that NASCAR is offering and whether teams feel like that's enough. And also, you know, there's going to be splits between the teams. I think some teams have already felt like NASCAR is starting to signal a deal that they're ready to accept, and some teams are are not ready to accept it yet. Ooh. So, so does that mean uh, you know the teams um, the teams had the most leverage? before this deal was done, right? And I think NASCAR did a good job of of maybe calling them on that and and basically had diamond hands with their leverage. And and I think that they were, my, my gut feeling in the conversations I had back then was like, I didn't feel like the teams had leverage, enough leverage to do what they wanted to do. And, and I, you know, one of the things that I definitely knew off of that was like part of the team strategy at the time, you know, really a year ago, um, was they felt maybe the networks NASCAR would have a hard time signing the networks if there wasn't some sort of commitment from the teams. Obviously, NASCAR was able to push forward and completely, you know, disregard that. So um, they've kind of disarmed the team. So does that? Do you feel like the potential ugly parts of this negotiation are over? Right. I mean, it was both sides. I would say both sides. The teams were kind of talking a big game, whether it was in, in the public or not. Um, I know you've had conversations on both sides um, in public and, and privately. Do you think the ugly parts are over um, given the big game that they had talked? Yeah. Great question. I'm wondering the same thing and I'm unclear on it. So basically it doesn't seem clear that, you know, the stunts and the ugly stuff is over. Um, it, it seems like, 
you know, just for example, speaking to one person last week who was close to several teams, uh, several top owners and drivers, et cetera, I asked them if they thought that, you know, the deal that NASCAR got last week with their media rights partners was going to ensure that a deal would get done by Daytona. And they said no. Uh, and so if the deal doesn't get done by Daytona, well, on one hand, it's fine because, you know, the next deal for the charter agreements and the media rights don't start till 2025. But that'll start opening up the opportunity for teams to, you know, potentially pull stunts on the track. There's been rumblings about things like that. Nothing's happened. But, um, you know, there's been rumblings about could teams, you know, somehow show their displeasure to NASCAR during a race. Um, Hmm. You know, obviously they could do things, they could do things kind of with the PR side and kind of the media side as well, as they kind of did when they held that original press conference with uh with some media back in 2022 during the robo weekend when they first kind of publicly signaled that they needed more money under you know according to them and that they weren't happy with the current team owner model so um look it doesn't mean that we know for sure that things are going to get ugly but it does seem like there's a potential divide or schism coming here where uh Mm -hmm. some teams feel like nascar's offering a pretty good deal and um, some other teams, they, they may feel like NASCAR is offering a decent deal, but they feel like this is a big opportunity for them to secure what they need for the future. And they're not going to necessarily just agree very easily. One part of that, of course, is the charters. What's going to happen with the length of you know the new term? The original deal was a nine-year deal because it was set up one year into the original 10-year agreements for the TV deals, and they wanted to evaluate it after the TV deals. Um, you know, teams want them to tra- uh, partners, charters to become permanent. Uh, NASCAR doesn't necessarily agree, but I have a feeling they'll meet somewhere in the middle. There's been talk of maybe like rolling renewals or auto renewals as long as teams meet certain uh, requirements. Mm-hmm. So we'll see exactly what gets done there. But uh, I don't think we can say for sure that the, the ugly stuff and the stunts are over with yet. Wow. And and th- when you mentioned stunts, you, you talked about on-track stunts, that sort of thing. It, has this been recently mentioned, you know, in, in the last three, six months? And it, any idea what that could be? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's been mentioned in the past several months. Um, what it would look like, I don't exactly know. You know, there's there's the imagination could run wild there about what it could be, about, you know, team stopping on the track or something like that. I, it feels like it's probably unlikely that they do something like that just because it would be so drastic. But, you know, the point is, is that there's different opinions behind the scenes with teams about how far along they are with NASCAR, what they should do to signal their displeasure with NASCAR, et cetera. So there's been a lot of debate about how they should approach that. Um, it seems unlikely they'll, they'll go that far because they haven't done it yet. And so if they didn't do anything last season, it seems unlikely that they'll do something that drastic. More likely would be things kind of more in the media scene, you know, announcing stuff, press conferences, mm-hmm. et cetera. But uh, I don't think we can rule anything out yet. Mm-hmm. Well, wow. they, you know, we if we know a couple of things f- for certain, obviously the, the team owners have toyed with the idea of running some kind of unsanctioned race or some, a promoted race of their own. Um, there's been rumors of that, of, you know, uh, all kinds of ideas and and things. Um, And then also, you know, we do know one thing that the teams need still need to show whatever they're, however they're just voicing their displeasure. They still have to show up to the track because they, they give up a ton of leverage the moment they don't show up to the track. That's when they lose their charter. Um, And I suppose that it, if it came to that point where they were going to actually boycott or not show up to the track, then you're talking about a real D day moment. So it is interesting that if they're going to do something, it has to be pretty creative, I guess. Yeah, that's a great point. They, they obviously, and you bring up a great point that they had signaled that, you know, the RTA could possibly look into some off season exhibitions. That was one of the things that they had kind of signaled that some people said, Hmm, that seems like it could be kind of a backdoor threat. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like you said, you have to run every race. So it, it doesn't seem likely that we'll see something super, super drastic. I still don't expect like a live golf sort of or, or you know, indie car breakup situation. I, I think the teams recognize that the reality is that 
starting a new series, I mean, the, NASCAR has 75 years of brand equity. Like, it's not it, – that's 75 years. It's not easy not going to anywhere. start a new series. And look at what they <laughs> just got for their TV deal. I mean, F1 is on fire around the world, and yet F1's getting 75 to 95 – Seventy-five to ninety million dollars annually for their TV rights. NASCAR is about to get one point one billion. Like so, NASCAR does have some significant advantages that make the teams probably not want to stray too far towards a, a breakaway series or something like that. But um, it will be interesting to see because there's certainly some people who feel like you know this is a big opportunity for the teams, and so they have to take advantage. And if that means uh, you know making NASCAR a little frustrated in the meantime, then then that's what it'll take so these next couple of months will be really interesting even as big as the tv deal was uh now we have a whole nother really big agreement to keep an eye on what's uh what's the timeline for this to get done the charter deal what are, what are the teams telling you they want done versus what do you think's reality and realistic i i think that as long as they get it done by like the midpoint of the season they'll be okay the deal doesn't start till 2025 so you know can they you know this point next year december 2024 can they be here without an agreement no i think that'd be pushing it way too much but it doesn't sound like they need it done by daytona you know they have a whole another year at that point under the current agreement to, to finish that off so i would look to the midpoint of the season interesting that makes sense um moving on from nascar before we let you go here we just there's, there's a story that's bubbling up in the f1 world i just saw you recently had a tweet about it and that is this this political drama of Susie and Toto Wolf being investigated by the FAA. What, what's the latest? What are you, you know, wh what is your impressions of what's happening here? Um, and where do you see this going? Well, Parker, we all know that the best drama in F1 is off the track. So uh, hopefully Netflix, <laughs> all these folks are at the ready right now, even though the season's over on the track. Um, yeah, I mean, I just saw coming, like I said, I was at that NASCAR uh, production facility opening today, but just coming back from that, I saw that the um, F1 teams have all released kind of coordinated statements saying that basically they didn't tattletale on Toto and that it wasn't them. So this is just pure chaos. It's kind of typical, you know, F1 bureaucracy chaos, uh, but yeah, I mean, it'll be really interesting. To see. Of course, there's that one report that came out from Business F1 Magazine, a uh, quite interesting article saying that the team principals were upset about Toto possibly uh, having received confidential information about the budget cap, having leaked that to the media, and then also receiving other confidential information because his wife, Susie Wolf, works for F1 Academy. So kind of explosive accusations. Um, of course, you know, uh, Susie Wolf came out yesterday and strongly denied these accusations. I believe Toto and Mercedes did as well through an official statement from Mercedes. So um, we'll see kind of where it plays out from here. But, yeah, just kind of typical F1 drama. Uh, you know, now they've got their budget cap. That's something that might be coming to, to NASCAR with the next uh, charter agreement. So maybe we'll see drama mm -hmm. like this in NASCAR eventually. Uh, they might have a budget floor and a budget ceiling in NASCAR come 2025. But, yeah, this is part of kind of some of the uh, drama coming out of F1 having their, their budget cap. And we all know, you know, this is um, on one hand sensational. On the other hand, this is kind of par for the course for, for F1. Uh, they, they have stories like this kind of every year in different ways. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on. Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting things out of it is that, um, you know, the FIA announced this investigation. And now the teams are saying, well, we didn't even tell the FIA about this. And so now F1 is really upset with FIA. They've been butting heads a lot recently. So now the BBC coming out with this report, citing sources in F1 saying that Liberty Media might want to eventually break away from the FIA. So, hmm. you know, in certain regards, some of this stuff is routine F1 drama, but in other ways, it's, it's quite interesting and, uh, you know, certainly worth keeping an eye on. Definitely. That is fast. And that. It's the exact discussion we just had about an hour and a half ago between Landon and I. And uh, I think we're going to have to see as this plays out. Uh, budget caps in NASCAR. I'd love to unpack that one. I think that's most likely a thing. But we are we we say this show goes twelve to three ish. We've we've run past that. We do, man. This has been very insightful. I want to have you back, Adam. You'll come back. We've now figured out how to get you on to the program. We need to have you come back, <laughs> right? Absolutely, we'd love to. Awesome. Uh, before we let you go, we have to do a question of the day. 
We ask every guest this, um, and I don't know if you've driven a race car before, but I know you follow a lot of racing, so it'd be interesting to get your perspective on this. We've been asking if you had the opportunity and could only pick one of these, would you drive a F1 car at Monaco or an Indy car at Indianapolis Motor Speedway Oval? I heard Brody Kostiki's answer. I'm going with Brody. I think you got to take wow. the Indy car on the on the Indy 500 Oval. Monaco is actually beautiful, but now we've got something crazier to aspire to. It's racing an F1 car in the Las Vegas Strip. I mean, it's not. There's no water nearby, but just the scenes are, are just absolutely insane. So, yeah. I mean, for me, I, I... think uh, obviously the Indy 500 is just one of the most incredible events, and, and driving an Indy car on that oval, uh, even Max Verstappen is scared to do it. So that's how you know it's something very special. <laughs> that, well said. Well said. You know what? It's it's unbelievable. I thought Monaco F1 would be the winner, clear and clear. And the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is now, what, three for four? Clearhead. That's amazing. Yeah, well, it's 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 a lock now because it's uh, it's three to one. Yeah. I, I guess it could tie uh, depending on yours, uh, our answers. So um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll clear, see. Clear, Adam. Clearly ahead, right? Appreciate you coming on. We're going to definitely have you back, but that was really amazing stuff. We appreciate it. Have a great day, man. Thank you. Hey there. Um, I got a request. Can you please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon below to be alerted to when we post all this great content? And really, it's a pact, because if you do that, then we'll keep posting great content. Also, Join us on Wednesdays from 12 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time for the live show, Money Lap Live. We interview people from around the motorsports world and just talk all things motorsports. It's awesome. Join us there.